Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Brushy Fork Baptist Church. We are so excited that you've chosen to worship with us this morning. And we look forward to, to worshiping the Lord uh, together. Uh, what, a, what a blessing it is to be in the house of the Lord. Let's turn to, to John chapter 3. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know, and bear witness to what we have seen. But you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things, and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does, not, does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Aenean near Selim, because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom, who stands and, and hears him, rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for all your many blessings. Lord, we thank you for this passage of Scripture. Lord, the challenge of the, the story of Nicodemus, how we are to be born again. Lord, the truth that Jesus continues to, to um, proclaim in, in the fact that he has come as the Son of God to, to forgive the sins of the world. That if we believe on him, then, then we can have our sins forgiven. And Lord, the, the truth that he has created us uh, to 
uh, live a life of obedience and, and uh, following him. And Lord, that uh, we see that Jesus' confrontation and, and the truth preached to the Pharisees is, is revealing to the, to the idolatry that is uh, present in each of our hearts. Lord, we thank you for this passage of Scripture. And Lord, as we, we look at uh, the fact that you have given us a promise, uh, and that promise is uh, that we can know that we are children of the King. Lord, that we can be assured of our salvation in the book of 1 John chapter 5. Lord, I pray that you would impart that truth uh, to us. And Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you would, turn to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. The title of my sermon this morning is Rooted in Belief and Assurance. Rooted in Belief and Assurance. And John has uh, been giving us some important instructions. Uh, he has instructed us that uh, uh, we are to overcome the world. And uh, he has also given us clear instruction about the testimony concerning uh, the Son of God. Uh, how uh, Jesus uh, came by water and the blood. Uh, how he is the one who is our redemption. He is the one who can save us from our sins. And uh, really we now enter into uh, the concluding message of John. John is going to wrap up this letter starting in verse 13, and he is going to, uh, going to bring it to a conclusion. We're going to stretch out the last uh, verses of this letter into two weeks. So uh, this week we are going to look at verses 13 through 17. But really at the heart of this, at the conclusion of, of what John has to say, he's going to share with us how we can be rooted in the belief in Christ and be assured of our eternal destiny. Now that is an important message. And in fact, this is at the very heart of the message that John had throughout all of this book. He wanted to share with the churches of Asia Minor that, uh, that the, the faith once received through the apostolic witness is the faith that they need to continue in. They don't need to follow the teaching of the secessionists, but they need to stay there, and they can, they can be assured, they can know that in following Jesus, they are exactly where they need to be, and their eternal destiny is secure. Uh, I don't know if you have ever lost something that you were absolutely assured you knew exactly where it was. Uh, to get up into the attic, there is an attic access at the parsonage in the utility room. And uh, right behind the attic access is a shelf. And on that shelf, I keep a headlamp because there's no lights in the attic. And if I need to go up there and look for something, then I just have a light right there and, and I'll look for it. Well, this week I had to go up in the attic and get something. And I turned around and sure enough, what was not there? That headlamp. I had to go up in the attic and look for something that was probably going to take me two minutes. Do you know how long it took me to look for that headlamp? I was probably looking for, uh, at, for 30 minutes, and I finally just gave up and said, I'm just going to get a flashlight, and I'm just going up there, and I'm getting done, and we'll figure out where this thing is later. Do you know where I found that thing a couple days later? On my dresser. I had not put it back where it needed to go. Sometimes we lose things. Sometimes we misplace things. But John wants us to know that we will not misplace our eternal destiny if we place our faith in Jesus. This is a vital message that John has. We're, we have a tendency to not put things back, to not put things where they need to go. We have a tendency to lose things. But John wants us to be assured that one thing that we will not lose is if we place our faith in Jesus, the hope of eternal life. Let's read verses 13 through 17. 
I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know uh, that we have the request that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will give him life. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death, there is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. Father, I pray that as we look at this passage of Scripture, that you would open our eyes to the truth here. I pray, Lord, that we would see that uh, our eternal destiny is not based on our own obedience standards. Lord, it's not based on our own responsibility. Lord, we are not the keepers of our own destiny, but Lord, you are. Lord, your promise uh, is uh, that uh, salvation is a gift that cannot be stolen or taken away. And Lord, the hope of that lies in the strength and power of Jesus Christ and not in our ability to keep his commands. So, Lord, we thank you for that. And I pray, Lord, as we look at these challenging words, we would see that our prayers are important and our prayers show a, a uh, connection to the relationship we have with you. But, Lord, uh, as we also look at this uh, perplexing thing, this sin unto death, I pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts to the truth that your word has for us. Lord, that it would not be scary. But, Lord, that it would uh, illuminate the, the hope that we have in Jesus. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. The big idea in 1 John chapter 5, verses 13 through 17, is we are to put our faith in the Son of God and be assured we have eternal life. We are to put our faith in the Son of God and be assured that our faith is is secure. That is an important message to us. That is an important message to the church of Asia Minor. So how does John get there? Well, let's look at verse 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. It's important to, to stop there. And if we are to going to put our faith in the Son of God and be assured that we have eternal life, first we have to pray with confidence that God hears and answers according to his will. Let me say that again. We need to pray with confidence, knowing that God hears us and answers according to his will. So, how does this belief, how does this promise of eternal life connect to our prayers? First, we have to look at what John says here. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Now, why does John say that? And specifically, why does he continue that you may know that you have eternal life? What is the connection between the, the name of the Son of God, between that title and the promise of eternal life? Well, John uses this language of believing in the name of the Son of God a couple of times in the Gospel of John. Uh, you don't have to turn there, but in, in, in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 12, he says, Yet to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. What is the key? Those who believe in his name, he is given the right to be children of God. What is that name? That is the name of the Son of God. Look also at John chapter 3. You don't have to turn there, but just listen. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. John connects these two things. The name of God and, and the title and the belief in that. He wants us to see that, that our belief is connected to the name. And, and that is 
that is significant. It's not that we, we know the name of Jesus, we, we know about Jesus, but, but John wants to convey that there is something important that is conveyed in the name of the Son of God. And this is a, a messianic title. Uh, the, the Jewish followers or those that would have been connected uh, and known something about the Jewish faith, it would not have been lost on them that this title, Son of God, is a connection to the promises of the Old Testament. This is a messianic title. So what John is telling the churches of Asia Minor is if you believe in the promises that God has given, through the patriarchs, through Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob, through, through Joseph, through uh, Moses, through King David, through Solomon, through the prophets. If you believe in those promises, if you connect to that, if, if you're placing your faith in that and, and, and believing that God is going to send this Messiah, then you have to understand that Jesus is the answer to that. So the belief in the name is connected to the title that that name represents. Jesus is the one that God sent to fulfill all of those messianic promises in that title. So there are plenty of people in this world that believe in Jesus as a name, right? Right? In fact, you can ask people all, all throughout town, do you, do you know that there was a Jesus that lived? And, and they connect to that historical fact. But there is a smaller number of people who believe in the name of the Son of God. In that title, and, and give allegiance to that title, that, that Jesus is everything that God promised. And they have placed their faith in Him and are resting in His promises for their eternal security. John connects this by pointing to the fact that our belief in all of the promises of God wrapped up in the person of Jesus Christ is significant. We can't just know about a historical figure. But we have to place our faith in the promise and everything that Jesus represents. We have to believe that. And if we do that, then he goes on. That you may know that you have eternal life. Second, John wants us to have a confidence in our salvation. John doesn't want to wrap up this letter where he's talking about the secessionists or trying to pull people out of the church and follow this new spirit-derived understanding of the gospel of Jesus. He does not... Uh, want them to, to follow them and to leave the promise of the, their eternal security. So how, the question is raised, how can we as sinners be confident in our salvation? How are we that mess up? How are we that people that fall short of God's call? How can we be assured of our salvation? John tells us we can be. How do we get there? We first have to realize that it does not rely on us, does it? Paul tells us this in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 10 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Paul is clear that the gift of salvation is a gift. It's a gift of grace. It isn't there uh, as something that we earn. It's not something that we gain by our works, but it is a gift. Jesus is the one that did everything to get our salvation. He's the one that lived the perfect life. He's the one that died on the cross on our behalf. And we, uh, as people, under the promise of God, how we receive that gift is by faith. You see, we didn't do anything to earn our salvation, did we? So it also seems true that we aren't the ones that do anything to keep our salvation, 
Our salvation is secure because it's secure in the fact that Jesus has earned it. And if we have a relationship, as John has said, if we have a relationship with Jesus and he has a relationship with the Father and, and we're all interconnected through that relationship, that, that Jesus and, and God's, the Father's relationship is pure and, and our relationship with Jesus and our relationship to God the Father is, is secure in that, then, then we can't mess it up just like we couldn't mess up Jesus' death on our behalf. It's outside of our realm to hold on to. We just have to trust the promises. Look at, listen to how John says it in John chapter 20, verse 31. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John wants us to see... That it's not by our works, it's not by our uh, own ability that we can have assurance, but it's because of the promise of Jesus. It's because of what he has done for us. So therefore, if we believe in the name of the Son of God, if we, if we have grasped the promise of God through the person of Jesus Christ, that he is our Redeemer, he is the one who has paid our sin debt, then we can be secure in our eternal life because nobody can take it away because God is the one who holds it. And no one is going to overpower God to take it away. Satan can't do that. All of Satan and his army of demons can't do it all together. Not an individual and not all the people combined on this earth can do it. So we are secure in our eternal life. So how do we know that we have that eternal life? And here is where John makes a turn that's rather interesting to us. John connects the fact of this new life, this belief in the Son, the gift of Jesus Christ, and, and our possession of eternal life. He connects that to our prayers in verses 14 and 15. And this is the confidence that's important, isn't it? John is telling, this is how we know. This is how we can be assured that we have eternal life. This is how we know that we believe in the Son of God. That we have toward Him. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And we know that He hears us and whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of Him. Now, does that sound confusing to you? It is a little bit confusing, isn't it? John, John presents this, but it's, it's a little bit confusing. What, what is John really saying as he presents this in verses 14 and 15? And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. This is significant because... It is only those who have a relationship with Jesus that, that God truly hears their prayers. Now, does that mean that, that someone who's in trouble, who has never uh, heard the name of Jesus, darkness, does that mean if they call out for God's help that he doesn't hear them? No. But what that does mean is that those who, as John has said, who are in, have walked into the light, who are able to stand in the presence of God, God has a special relational connection with them, and, and God hears their petitions. Yes, there is a tangential way that God hears the, the petitions of those who have no knowledge of Him or, or have no allegiance to Him, but there is a special way that God is in tune with the prayers of his people. And that shows that we have a relationship. If, if God tunes his ear to our prayers, then that means we have a special relationship. Let me illustrate it this way. Adam and Eve in the garden, after they had sinned, what did they do? As John says, they shrunk back in fear and they hid themselves, didn't they? Did they have any confidence that God would hear their prayers? 
No, they were ashamed and they didn't even want to be in his presence. The healing to that is that we can come out of the darkness and into the light and we can stand in the presence of God and talk to him and share our position, petitions. The beauty of this is if we have a relationship with God, we know that he hears our prayers. We're not like Adam and Eve that shrink back in fear and have no confidence that God he hears our prayers because of the sin that separates us. That sin has been dealt with. And here John is saying that, that if, if God hears our prayers, that means we have a relationship with us. And in verse 15, he continues, and we know that he hears us in whatever we ask. So not only does he have a special ear tuned to us, but he cares about it. He truly hears us. He hears our petitions. And that um, proves that we have a, an intimate relationship, that, that division between Adam and Eve in the garden after their sin has been broken down. Instead, we can walk in the light in his presence. And that he hears in whatever we ask. And then he concludes this by saying, we know that we have requests that we have asked of him. And here's how John solidifies this. He says, you know that you believe. You know that you have uh, that relationship and the, the, the gift of eternal life. Because God hears your prayers in a special way. And whatever you ask, he answers. But not only that, but you have true prayers that have been answered in your life. Here's the proof that's in the pudding. Have you prayed? And has God answered those prayers? This is why John connects this. He says, you have a, a, a connection with God that, that if you pray to him, and we're going to talk about this according to his will in just a second, but if you pray with him and he answers your prayer, that is a proof that you have a relationship with him because God pays special attention to the prayers of his children in a way that he doesn't pay special attention to just general prayers by people who do not claim the name of Jesus. Because we know that if we have answered prayers, we have prayed according to the will of God. Now, does that mean that we can go to God and, and we can have our laundry list of things we want and God is just going to be that benevolent uh, father figure that's just going to bestow on us everything we want, never dreamed of? That's not the case, is it? That's not reality. That's not what John is talking about. What John is talking about is that we pray in accordance to his will. John wants us to see that this relationship connects us to the Father. And if we're connected to the Father, the Father wants to give us good gifts. Just like any father wants to give his children good gifts. Not destructive gifts. Not gifts that are going to lead them into destructive destruction. But he wants to give them good things. And if God has answered our prayer and given us good things, then we are connected to him through faith. We have believed in the Son of God and we have the promise of eternal life. So our relationship is proven through our prayers. The proof of our healed relationship is answered prayer. But that brings up a question. How come all our prayers aren't answered in the way we want? You see, that important part of this passage is according to God's will. And, and that's important because uh, some prayers that we pray... I mean, we're not God, and we don't have infinite knowledge. And sometimes we pray, and, and the answer is no, or, or the answer is wait. Sometimes we don't get the, the, the answer that we're looking for. 
So what happens? Why do sometimes our prayers not get answered the way we want it? Well, it's because we haven't prayed according to God's will. So let's think about that. What does that mean? How, how do we deal with prayers that aren't answered in the way that we want, even if they are good things? Let's take the most extreme measure. Why do sometimes when we pray for somebody's healing, sometimes it doesn't come? Sometimes they are not healed and they even die. Luke 13, 1 through 5 helps us here a little bit. It talks about uh, in the city of Jerus Jerusalem, there was this tower, and uh, the tower just tragically fell down and killed 13 people. And, and the Pharisees came uh, to Jesus, and they were challenging him, and they, they wanted to peg him, and, and they wanted him to say that those 13 people had special sin in their lives, and this was a judgment of God upon them. But Jesus wouldn't say that. He said, Jesus is, is looking at, at the Pharisees and saying that just because we live in a fallen world and tragedies happen, doesn't mean that those who have suffered tragedy are under the judgment of God. Jesus looked at them and said, the sinners that that building fell on were no bigger sinners than any of us. There wasn't, it wasn't because their sin was so much weightier that the building fell on them. Sometimes tragic things happen because sin has been unleashed on this earth. Adam and Eve's uh, sin didn't just affect them, but it affected everything. Sometimes we experience tragedies. And sometimes those tragedies even go against the prayers that we've asked for protection or healing. But yet, it is God who seeks to bring redemption out of these tragedies. How can we trust God even when we know that tragic things happen even to seemingly innocent people? And we can still trust God's goodness because God still brings things to come even through tragic circumstances that are good and he redeems that tragedy. I can't explain that in all circumstances, but I do know that it's true. God can take the most horrific circumstance and he can redeem it and he can bring goodness out of those tragedies. What does that prove? That proves that we can trust God and even if we pray for something good, and God doesn't give it to us, we can trust that he has done exactly what is according to his will, and his will is still good, even though there may be tragedy involved in that will. We may not be able to explain it, but one day God may show us exactly what he was doing. We must remember, we don't have a heavenly perspective. We don't have the perspective of God to know exactly what is going on in each and every circumstances and how he's working it towards his own good pleasure. We have to trust him. And we know that God seeks to give his children good gifts. And we know that because he sent his only son to die on an old rugged cross on our behalf. If, if God is good enough to do that, he's good enough to trust, even in those tragic circumstances. When someone dies from a seemingly senseless tragedy or a sickness that was not healed or any other tragic circumstance, because God is good and God seeks to give good gifts, when God doesn't answer our prayers, we can still trust 
his goodness. And we can still trust that his goodness is being brought forth. His will is being done. So that leads us to the second thing. We're to, to pray with a confidence that God hears and answers according to his will. And, and God seeks to give us good gifts. But secondly, we are to pray for those who are caught in sin, not unto death. Listen to verse 16. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will give him life. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death, there is a sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. At this point, just like verses 14 and 15, we may scratch our heads a little bit. This, this takes a little bit of thinking to process. What is John saying? He's just told us that we should pray in confidence that God hears us and will answer according to his will. John has just connected the fact that our faith in the son, name of the Son of God and our uh, attainment of eternal life is grounded in the gospel of Jesus Christ and that is proven by answered prayer in our life. Now he turns to a specific application to the circumstances that he is addressing. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life. Here, we, we must think, okay? There's that looming question, what is the sin that leads to death? That's what we all want to know because we don't want to do it, right? But put that aside for a second. But think about what John is addressing. And John is addressing the fact that there are leaders of the successionist movement that are, that are preaching a gospel that's, that says that I have received something by the power of the Holy Spirit that is contrary to the, the preaching of the apostles and, and those. This is a new gospel. And those secessionists are drawing people out of the church to follow them. And John is writing this letter to encourage the church to stay true to the gospel they once received by the apostolic witness. To, to realize they have the power of the Holy Spirit within them and that they don't need this new word, this new voice that has been given. They have received everything that they need and they need to stay true to that. Now John applies this connection to the Son of God and our eternal life and our prayers by telling the church, if you see a brother or sister committing a sin not leading to death, what is that sin? There is a distinction between those who are preaching and leading the, the secessionists. There are, there are those that have fully bought into it, aren't they? And they are leading this movement that are trying to draw people out of the church. That is one group of people. And then there is another group of people who are in the church and they are being enticed by this message, aren't they? Here John is addressing, pray for those that are being enticed out of the church. John wants them to realize that they have a relationship with the Son of God. They have the hope of eternal life. And that hope is proven through answered prayer. And here John points them and prods them. Pray for those that are being drawn out of the church. That are being enticed by this false gospel. That is a sin not leading to death. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death, there is a sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is a sin that does not lead to death. So understanding those two groups of people, now I think we can better understand what it means uh, with this sin unto death. What is this sin unto death. We know from Scripture, the example, that there are <coughs> sins that Christians can commit that leads in God bringing them home. And, and that is illustrated by Ananias and Sapphira in, in Acts chapter 5. They, uh, they lied about 
the amount of money that they were giving to the church. They kept some back for themselves and they lied to the Holy Spirit and God took them home, didn't he? We also understand from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that there uh, were believers in the church and they were abusing the picture of the Lord's Supper in such an extent that some had fallen sick and some had died. There are some sins in which we uh, contradict or blaspheme the Holy Spirit and, and in, in truth and in complete transparency. We don't know where that line is crossed, do we? There are plenty of preachers today that I would love to have a little bit of this power and God just take them home immediately. There are, there are preachers in Africa today preaching a gospel to people that are poorer than we could ever imagine. I mean, they don't even have two cents. They've never dreamed of two cents to rub together. They are as poor as poor comes. And there is a preacher preaching to them that if they would have enough faith, if they would have enough belief in Jesus, that he would give them that Mercedes, he would give them that mansion, he would give them that castle. And that is a lie straight from the pit of hell. And I don't know why God doesn't just take those preachers home. That's his responsibility. But here we do know that there are some sins where God does prematurely bring people home. And I think this fits into this distinction. There are the leaders that are seeking to lead the movement to bring people out of the church. I think John is telling the church, you don't have to pray for them. Now notice, he doesn't command them not to pray. He just advises them that maybe these are pearls cast before swine. If, if they're already under the judgment of God, it's probably not going to do much good. I think there is a distinction, though, where, where John is saying, Okay, church, you may not pray specifically, and maybe you do, and ask the Lord to have mercy on those preachers. But focus on your efforts of prayer on those that are being enticed. Those whose consciences are being uh, violated and they're struggling over this choice. John is wanting to direct, uh, direct their prayers to these people that are in trouble. Pray for that brother or sister who's not doing a sin that leads to death. They're, they're trying to do what God wants them to do in, in all their best um, uh, ability under the conscience and led by God, but yet they're being enticed by these um, these false preachers. And Paul encourages the church to pray for those brothers <coughs> and sisters. I don't think John wants us to get hung up even though he repeats it several times that there is a sin unto death. He wants us to, to, to understand that that is out there, that that is a possibility. But I think what John is, is pointing at is the fact that there are people who are caught up in this, who aren't committing a sin unto death. They're just trying to live out their gospel witness the best they understand. And, and they need God's help to clarify it in their mind. John wants us to pray for God's and the Holy Spirit's clarity in their lives. That may not be totally fulfilling in your thinking of, now I understand the sin unto death because I haven't completely answered it, have I? But I hope that we look and see that, that even though that lays out there, John's emphasis is upon those that have not done this sin. He wants us to pray so that they would be healed. That they wouldn't be enticed to go out of the church, but they would stay rooted in the gospel once received. Why? Because he wants them to be able to walk in the light and have this relationship with God. There is a way in which this is even true, whether it's a believer or an unbeliever. God wants us to live 
uh, or, or John wants us and God wants us to, to live in such a way that our conscience is clear. There's not a sin problem. There is not a, a, a denial of God where our conscience is pricked. He wants us to be able to walk in the light and live a life before our Heavenly Father. Not in guilt, not in shame, but unlike Adam and Eve, to, to leave the darkness and shame and to walk out into the light in relationship with God. That is John's desire, and that's why he connects this to prayer. He's, he tells the church, they have confessed the name of Jesus. They know the messianic promise. They're placed their faith. They have eternal security. They know whom they believe, and they know the promises for which they have received. John tells them they know that because God has answered their prayers. God has that close and intimate relationship with them. And now John instructs them to turn their prayers for those believers that are struggling. That this is a, a problem for. And, and we, we all know those people at points in our life. And maybe we've even been that person within a point of our life where where. Our conscience before God is not clean. We don't know what to do. and We're seeking out what we should do. And here John is instructing us to pray for those who are struggling. To pray for those who have this struggle in their life. Why? Because John wants us to have that confidence. God wants us to know that it's not based on us, but it's based on God in his Holy Spirit. Our eternal security rests in Christ's completed work. And if we believe in the Son of God and all that represents, the messianic promises, the, the fact that Jesus uh, died in our place, if we receive all those promises and we place our faith, if we're trusting him, then we be, can be secure in our salvation. We can walk in the light, and John wants everybody to be able to do that. That's part one of the closing of John's letter. I hope it is, you see it as powerfully as I see it. I think that is a convincing message, that, that John seeks for us to, to live in a way in which our conscience is, is open before the Lord and we are walking before God. That may mean that we need to confess some sins. That may, may mean we need to repent. And, and God is, is faithful to just to forgive those sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, isn't he? We can do that and we can walk in the light. And maybe there's other people around us who we know they're struggling and maybe we need to intercede on their behalf. We need to ask God to to change them and give them uh, an, an a, a open conscience before him. A conscience not drug down by grief or guilt, but is uh, open and secure before him so that they can walk in the light. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the challenge that it is. Lord, I pray that you would uh, be with us Lord, that we would uh, have security in our salvation because of the work of Jesus Christ uh, and our faith that is connected to all those promises. But Lord, I pray that we would take to heart this connection to prayer. And Lord, that we would truly pray for those that are in trouble. And Lord, that we would wait your uh, fulfillment of that, knowing that uh, you are working things according to your will. Lord, we can trust you. So Lord, we ask, and then we wait to see uh, how you will respond and how you would answer, knowing that you seek to give us good gifts as a good father would. Lord, knowing your goodness and your grace that has been uh, bestowed upon us. And Lord, we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. If you feel like the Lord is leading you to have a personal relationship with him, then let me just share with you the best news. To share with you the best news, I have to share with you the bad news. The bad news is that we are sinners uh, and we fall short of the glory of God. Paul tells us for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. That means that that relationship in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 that Adam and Eve had, 
that they were in relationship with God, that means that our sins break that relationship. Just like Adam and Eve rebelled against God, we are sinners too and we rebel against God and that relationship is broken. That's bad news, but that's not the worst news. The worst news is we can't fix that relationship. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. That means uh, the, what we have earned by our sin is death and we can't change that. That's depressing. That's hard. But God doesn't leave us there. Thankfully, he gives us good news, even amongst this bad news and the worst news. God gives us good news, and the good news is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus came. He died on an old rugged cross. He, would, he lived the perfect life that God called us to. He died on our behalf, and, and Jesus offers us the free gift of eternal life. He offers us salvation. That's the good news, but the best news is that Jesus' offer can be applied on our account. We can know Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. We can have that relationship restored. How do we do that? We do that by faith. Faith is an odd word, but it simply means trust. I'm trusting that the seat that I'm sitting in is going to keep me off the floor. We have to place our faith. We have to trust that Jesus is who he says he is, and he did what he said he did. We have to trust that. And we have to trust that he will honor his promises, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We express that oftentimes by praying. So if you'd like to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I encourage you to pray a prayer uh, something like this, where you uh, tell God that you recognize that you're a sinner and that your sins have separated and broken that relationship with him and to tell him that you're sorry and, and to realize that Jesus uh, came to be the answer. He came to, to die and to live the perfect life and to die in your place. And that you are accepting, you believe that Jesus did that. And you want his death to be applied to your account. You want the forgiveness of your sins. And you want to follow Jesus in obedience the rest of your life. If you've made that decision, would you reach out to us? Would you email us at info at brushyforkbaptist.com or contact us on Facebook? We'd love to hear that you've made a, a commitment to follow the Lord. God bless.